Hi, everybody. We are going to take a trip into art and politics. I'm going to start you out uh, looking at literature from the CIA, not great literature by any means, but literature nevertheless, on how operatives can use trickery and deception. We'll see a comic book that the CIA put out in Nicaragua to get people to realize that you can fight a war without guns. And I'll show you some of those kind of slippery eel techniques. I have a lecture titled Politically Active Art that does include, of course, politically active art, but also it includes some performances that may not be overtly political, although highly informative and really shrewd in what it says about the art world, and in particular, the art world that includes getting your master's degree and that kind of training in particular. I have also a lecture on landscapes in art, and mostly we're looking at paintings in art. And I want to use that as a way to kind of break into how Trevor Paglin's Six Landscapes, a lecture that he gives that you're going to watch and do an assignment on, how these landscapes of Trevor Paglin fit into the world of art, but also are extremely, I think, brilliant in what they do in terms of uncovering things that the government doesn't want us to see. They're really, I think, really important artistically today. Then I have a, in the next lecture that I do, which will be very short, a lecture on objectless art and monetization in art. And we will look at cryptocurrency, AI, NFT. And one of the extra credit assignments includes writing a paper about our class with ChatGPT. I hope that will be informative and entertaining for you. So let's get into it. Our introductory slides. We're looking at art and politics, studying the politics at work in the Central Intelligence Agency, and how the government agency operates through trickery and deception. Once again, we realize what the surface presents is not necessarily how the world operates. We study art and literature, as I said earlier, through dirty tricks and deception. We'll also look at depictions of the CIA in film as well. We will also study how an artist named Trevor Paglin uses technology, photography, and literature to uncover how the government engages in surveillance in particular, the NSA, to gain an upper hand in power around the world and the U.S. Before we go into that, I thought we should try to tie in early political literature in the Renaissance, in particular Machiavelli's The Prince. Machiavelli's Machiavelli's The Prince is a treatise from 1513 that calls for the unification of Italy under a powerful and courageous leader. The notorious little book laid out the guidelines for how an aspiring ruler might gain and maintain political power. Well, what he's writing is really at odds in relationship to perhaps uh, other literature around the time period, in particular Castelleone's The Book of the Courtier, where he is telling us that the ideal man to work, man of course in this time period, to work in the court in, uh, for a prince or for a king or somebody, a duke, somebody of that kind of importance, that they should be a master of all skills, a master of himself, a medieval warrior displaying physical proficiency of a champion athlete, possess the refinements of a humanistic education, no Latin, Greek, their own native language, familiar with the classics. They should be able to speak well. They should be able to compose verse, draw, play a musical instrument, and more importantly in the court, 
they should be able to do so with an air of nonchalance and grace. So the primary duty of a courtier is to be a well-rounded gentleman and to influence the ruler for wise governance. And this, of course, is happening around the idea that that makes for the best kind of ruler, to have people around them who have a certain amount of virtue, the self-confidence and vitality of the self-made individual, someone who's mastered fate um, and balancing humanist ideas, human perfectibility, and however, the realities of greed and ignorance and cruelty means that that might not be the best way to go about it. So in Machiavelli's The Prince, he pictures a secular prince who's schooled in war, the lessons of history, and the ruler should trust no one, least of all mercenary soldiers. They must imitate a lion in their fierceness, but also act like a fox to outsmart their enemies. Finally, in the interest of the state, this kind of neutral word state to stand in for uh, uh, what your, your power is standing in for or protecting, that a strong, straight, a strong state is made by someone who will justify any means in maintaining power. Cunning and violent, this is the only way that someone can survive in the politics of the state. You should be, the question he asks is, is, is it better to be feared or loved? He feels that being feared is safer. Because if you're feared, even if you don't win the love of your people, you may escape their hate. And certainly, I think, Machiavellian politics certainly play into the role of state organizations, and maybe in politicians today, where we often see that power is more important than your belief system, and gaining power and maintaining power is certainly true. Uh, rather than if your um, if your ethics are being held up or if what you say are actually your actions. Okay, so let's get into the CIA. A little bit of history on the CIA, and then I want to show you a little bit of the literature coming out of the CIA. So the agency is a civilian foreign intelligence service of the federal government of the United States, officially tasked with gathering, processing, and analyzing national security information from around the world, primarily through the use of human intelligent, intelligence and performing covert actions. Harry S. Truman created the CIA under the direction of the, the under the direction of a director of the CIA by uh, who is under the direction of the president on January 22, 1946. Unlike the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, which is a domestic security service, the CIA has no law enforcement function and is officially mainly focused on overseas intelligence gathering with only limited intelligence collection. That is usually taken care of by the NSA, the National Security Administration. It is the only agency authorized by law to carry out oversee and oversee covert action at the behest of the president. It exerts foreign political power through its tactical divisions, and it's instrumental in establishing intelligence services in several U.S. allied countries, in particular being very effective in Central and South America and overturning governments in an effort to stop communist regimes from getting closer to the United States and allying with Russia and, of course, Cuba. The CIA has grown in size after September 11th, 2001, and has increasingly expanded its role, possibly illegally, including covert paramilitary operations. Operation Condor. So Condor was the United States-backed campaign of political repression and state terror involving intelligence operations and the assassination of opponents. 
Due to its clandestine nature, the precise number of, direct, of deaths directly attributed to Operation Condor is highly disputed. Some estimates are at least 60,000 deaths can be attributed to Condor. Victims include dissidents, leftists, union and peasant leaders, priests, monks, nuns, students and teachers, intellectuals, and suspected guerrillas. Basically anyone that the U.S. was afraid could gain control or influence and oppose U.S. power. And this seems to be acting under the guise that everything the U.S. does is good or useful and that the U.S. doesn't have maybe some uh, iffy people and principles that it is working under. And of course, like we learned from Machiavelli a few moments ago, the U.S. as a world power intends to stay as a world power through whatever means are necessary. So Condor's key members were governments in Central and South America. They provided planning, coordination, training on torture, technical support, supplied military aid, and uh, also during the Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and Reagan administrations, such support was uh, frequently routed through the CIA. Cooperation amongst the various security services has existed prior to the creation of Operation Condor with the aim of eliminating Marxist subversion. And again, this is assuming that automatically Marxism is bad and also assuming that Marxism automatically relieves to the repressive communist governments that we have seen in Russia and China and North Korea. MK Ultra. Project MK Ultra. This was an illegal human experimentation program designed and undertaken by the CIA intended to develop procedures and identify drugs that can be used in interrogation to weaken individuals and force confessions through brainwashing and psychological torture. It began in 1953, was halted in 1973. MK Ultra used numerous methods to manipulate subjects' mental states and brain functions such as high doses of LSD and other psychoactive drugs, other chemicals without the subject's consent, electroshock therapy, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual abuse, and other torture. MK Ultra, mind control, by the way, the MK is mind control with a K, Ultra, was preceded by two drug-related experiments, Project Bluebird and Project Artichoke, organized through the CIA's Office of Scientific Intelligence and coordinated within the U.S. Army Biological Warfare Laboratories. The program engaged in illegal activities, including the use of U.S. and Canadian citizens as unwitting test subjects. Over 7,000 American veterans took place uh, took part in these experiments non-consensually during the 1950s through the 70s. MK Ultra's scope was broad with activities carried out under the guise of research at more than 80 institutions aside from the military, including colleges, universities, hospitals, prisons, and pharmaceutical companies. It was first brought to the attention by the Church Committee of the United States Congress and Gerald Ford's United States President's Commission on CIA activities within the United States, investigative efforts were hampered by CIA Director Richard Helm's order that all MK Ultra files must be destroyed in 1973. The Church Committee and the Rockefeller Commission investigations relied on the sworn testimony of direct participants and on the small number of documents that survived Helm's order. Dirty Tricks. Dirty Tricks are clandestine activities carried out by a covert action group to discredit, destabilize, or eliminate an opposing regime, an opposing candidate, in the case of uh, President Nixon uh, in the 70s, and one of its agencies or departments or an individual. You're trying to discredit people, make them seem crazy, or to pin ideas or pass deeds on them that maybe are not true. 
They will do this from false rumors to sabotage, to from overthrow to assassination. The history of dirty tricks is really part of the CIA, a long history. Among the most significant examples in this extensive catalog are the many attempts to undermine or neutralize Cuban dictator Fidel Castro. They rise, range from long-scale conspiracies and assassination plans, the Bay of Pigs invasion, to bizarre brainstorms at the fringe of practicability. An example of the latter was a plot to introduce a substance that would cause Castro's famous beard to fall off and thus presumably eliminate his machismo and credibility with the Cuban people. Um, they were trying to put drugs in his shoes, uh, there's just, there's so many things you begin to just really wonder, like, should this really be part of the American uh, political system? And what I often think is probably other countries are doing the exact same thing. And again, Machiavelli, we have to do really unpleasant things to keep in power. And of course, as an American staying in power, I have always been told is very important. As a critical mind, I have real, real questions about that. So Castro was uh, not the only leader targeted by CIA tricks. They also included Chilean President Salvador Allende, who was steering his na nation towards Marxism in the early 1970s. The CIA bribed members of the Congress and employed a number of means to foment unrest in Chile and ultimately leading to an assassination of President Allende, uh, which ultimately uh, meant a change in government, one more suitable for the United States. And by the way, the United States has made some mistakes in this and then turned on the very people that they used to get in power. Uh, we have also seen this in various stages of Central and South American dirty tricks. Literature from the CIA, the official manual of trickery and deception. We are looking at a picture of an operative being taken secretly out of a building into another building by surrounding themselves with a pallet of goods and then sitting inside of that pallet. So the manual, the infamous manual, is written by magician John Mulholland, a stage performer who honed his skills trading tricks in the back of New York City's um, Martinic magic shop during the Cold War, the CIA paid Mulholland $3,000 to write a top secret guide on trickery and deception, a James Bond meets Harry Houdini textbook, as master magician Lance Burton once described it. All copies were thought to have been destroyed in 1975, but two intelligence agents managed to get their hands on the document and publish it decades later. So the CIA manual was part of the MK Ultra project that we just discussed, and again was supposedly destroyed, but not quite. So in this manual, which you can find online, here it is here, the official CIA manual of trickery and deception. And in this really amazing book, we get an introduction into the art of deception, the art of being invisible, the art of, of uh, being a magician, and we see all kinds of really fascinating things in here. And this link that I have here illustrates a few of them rather than us going through those couple hundred pages. So. You find things like secret signals in shoe line, uh, shoelace patterns so that you can see who an operative is and what they're doing by simply looking at their shoelaces. Picking up a piece of paper by having a wax-covered book that you put on top of it. One of my very, very favorite parts of this book 
is when you're an operative in another country, look as stupid as possible to throw people off your scent. Look disheveled. Don't comb your hair. And, you know, um, rub your... Uh, um, rub your, uh, uh, your naughty parts. Uh, and my favorite part is when someone is staring at you and they th you think that they're on to you, stick your finger as far up your nose as possible because basically you look like an idiot and then so that person will just assume that you're nobody important. They talk about how to steal. Uh, they tell you how to make uh, guns, like a toothpaste gun, um, and how basically illusions work in terms of smuggling bodies. All kinds of really fantastic, outrageous, and silly ideas. Another example of CIA literature that is much harder to find in fact, I don't know if it exists on the internet, is a book passed out in Nicaragua, a comic book, to illustrate dirty trick operations. So in other words, you may not have a military, you may not have a gun, but you can hamper the smooth working of your government and community by writing anti-government slogans on walls. Uh, by breaking the windows and street lights and stoplights, um, by breaking into your boss's car, uh, by going to work and stealing the tools from work and throwing them away, being late to work, calling in sick to work. Various ways to uh, wreck um, uh, uh, vehicles, uh, dirt in carburetor, sugar in the gas tank, um, other great stuff that I particularly like, uh, going into the bathrooms and putting sponges in the bathroom to make them overflow, spilling ink on documents, obviously this is less effective in the digital age, uh, calling your boss and threatening them, uh, uh, calling in false alarms, false crimes, tax in the streets, cutting down tree branches so people can't get to work. Wow. <laughs> yes, this is literature put out by the CIA to, again, help everyday people to hamper their government and their country. And remember, these are autonomous countries, many of who have either voted for leaders or are in support of leaders. And governments are trying, all foreign governments are trying to find ways to hamper other governments. We have seen that in the United States. And in fact, we know in the 2016 election that Russian operatives were using social media to discredit not only candidates in the presidential election, but to discredit the whole idea of democracy in general. And it worked pretty well. It's working pretty well. President Nixon and dirty tricks. So Richard Nixon, Richard M. Nixon, uh, also known as uh, Tricky Dicky, uh, <laughs> he compiled an enemies list in 1969 and he was trying to stay in power by discrediting political opponents, either on the, his side of the aisle or, of course, the other uh, party of the Democrats. He went so far as to order two spies to be included in the Secret Service detail to follow Senator Edward Kennedy um, to catch him with a woman companion that would ruin his bid for running for office in 1976. So I imagine these operations are always going on. Now, how closely are they tied to the political candidates? How much do the political candidates know about them? Um, that is totally up for debate, and I don't have the knowledge on that. 
Uh, but I guarantee you it, it goes on all the time in some way or another. So Nixon was harassing. He had his opponents through the IRS to conduct audits, um, through the CIA's special operation groups. Uh, he's conducting Operation Chaos, which is spying on the left and black militant organization in the 60s and early 70s. And he's also ordering his chief of staff, Halderman, to use wiretaps against leading Democrats uh, to keep after him, he said, quote, and maybe we can get a scandal on any, any of the leading Democrats. The FBI, acting on presidential orders, wiretap people, American citizens, without obtaining the normal judicial warrants, including people in sensitive government positions. Henry Kissinger himself ordered taps placed on staffers that he thought were leaking classified information to the press. The White House Special Investigations Unit hired a group of plumbers, quote-unquote plumbers, to conduct special assignments. All of this ultimately is going to lead to the break-in in the Watergate Hotel that was the headquarters of the Democratic Party in the election of their candidate and will lead ultimately to the resignation of President Nixon. So in other words, the more that you get into dirty tricks, the more likely dirty tricks are also likely to come back and bite you. Um, be careful out there. In literature, we don't really know much about the CIA uh, until the CIA starts popping up in movies. Probably one of the earliest times that we become aware of uh, American citizens is through Ian Fleming's character, James Bond. And this recurring character, Felix Later, who is a CIA operative and kind of the opposite of the British form of the CIA or their secret service in James Bond. And you'll find this character reoccurring in James Bond quite a bit. We also become familiar with Condor in the 1975 film Three Days of the Condor where we see a Joe Turner, a name, character named Joe Turner. He is a CIA analyst codenamed Condor and he works at the American Literary Historical Society in New York City which is actually a clandestine CIA office. We're going to see a lot of this clandestine CIA offices claiming to be other things when we study Trevor, Trevor Paglin and his uh, six landscapes. You can see how much depth Trevor takes in terms of investigating these things. Three Days of the Condor uh, is still a movie that you know I'll sit and watch a little bit of any time it comes on. Um, and it kind of is one of those movies that shows you that even within the clandestine operation of the, co of the company, nobody can ever be trusted. And they're always playing cat and mouse games with the people and with other governments. More recent film from 2008, Burn After Reading. We also get a window into the CIA when Osborne Cox quits his job as a CIA analyst, plans on writing a memoir um, that he cannot pronounce the name, uh, and that ultimately the file that he's working on gets left at a gym, and then the gym members decide that they want money to return this, and they try to give it to the Russians. The Russians think that there's nothing in there of any worth, and then also the Russian at the embassy is also a CIA operative. It's a great Coen Brothers film. I highly, highly recommend it. And then, of course, the CIA in music. And uh, one of the great songs by the Fugues, CIA Man, Who Can Kill a General in His Bed, Overthrow Dictators If They're Red, Fucking A Man, CIA Man. Who can train gorillas by the dozens, send them out to kill their untrained cousins, fucking a man, CIA man. 
who can take the sugar from a sack, pour in LSD and put it back, sing it with me, fucking a man, CIA man. Uh, it is a great short rock song and really, really very accurate in terms of how the agency operates. For your assignment on this, I would like you to watch this documentary on the CIA. I want you to tell me what the CIA is and why you think it operates in secrecy. Why do governments act and have operatives act in secrecy, essentially beyond the rules of law? So again, when you have government agencies operating beyond the rules of law, what does that mean to law in terms of how it's supposed to be applied evenly to everybody? What do you agree with in the documentary? What don't you agree with in the documentary? Then I want you to review some of the content in the CI Manual of Trickery and Deception. I would like you to tell me what tactics seem reasonable when acting as a spy, what seems silly. And I would like examples in both of your questions. Uh, also, then, for number three, um, and remember always to number uh, your answers when I read them, please. Don't just make them one paragraph. Read the pages from the lecture section on the CIA comic book passed out in Nicaragua. And what do you think about these operations to disrupt a country's economy? Do you think they work? Give an example and explain why you think they might and might not work. Second part of the lecture today and uh, leading to our second assignment is politics in art. And this is kind of a way for us to begin to understand the context of Trevor Paglin and his artwork. So I start here with a, uh, an image from North, the North Korean games where we are seeing the state controlling aesthetics in terms of serving the political party. Walter Benjamin is writing about the aestheticization of politics. Benjamin is a German writer in the early part of the 20th century. He's talking about the way that the spectacle allows masses to express themselves without seeing their rights recognized and without affecting the relations of ownership with the proletarian masses, uh, that th which the proletarian masses aim to eliminate. So he says that fascism sees its salvation in giving these masses not their right, but instead a chance to express themselves. Also, alternatively, this term has been used also for ideologically opposing synthesis, where an art, rather than being made to subordinate political life, instead is separate from it or attempting to reveal how politics and political life work. And that certainly is alive and well in contemporary art in America today, for sure. Now, the first kind of uh, co-opting aestheticization is in socialist realism. This is used in communist countries. It is done simply, no abstraction, and it always shows the state as a loving patriarch and whoever represents the state, the dictator, or the general, or the president. And here we are seeing Joseph Stalin not as a mass murderer and fearmonger, but Stalin loves babies, and the babies love Stalin. They love their country, the hammer and sickle, the babies holding flowers. How could you not love Joseph Stalin? if these are the only images that you have access to. And to be honest with you, it works. It always works any time the government controls art and media. The only message you get out is that one side. And that's why the freedom of expression and the freedom of media, whether you like or you don't like the messages of those media, are very important to exist 
And hopefully what you do is you have a populace that's smart enough to understand right and wrong in relationship to this. Other politically active artists that I think are important include Barbara Kruger. So Kruger worked at, in graphic design for Condé Nast Publications, and then she began to make art in 1977 using the language of graphic design and advertising. She is appropriating photographs from other sources, blowing them up, sometimes reversing or solarizing the image, and then using the typeface Futura and the red um, uh, line rules that were used in new typography and at the Bauhaus and that are a signal of modern advertising. One of her most important pieces is the poster, Your Body is a Battleground. Uh, this message to women is telling you that your body is not necessarily in your control. And that's always a question you really should ask yourself because I think you're led to believe that your body is yours and you can do with it what you like. But what we find increasingly in America, once again, with the overturning of Roe versus Wade and also the hatred of transgender people and politics, is that really you have limited control over your body. And I think certainly we can find this in the literature of Sigmund Freud in terms of civilization and its discontents, that once again, to be in a civilization means you do not have complete control and you cannot do whatever you want. Um, now, mostly I think Freud is writing in relationship to others, but let's be honest, if you're a woman in the United States, or many other countries for that matter, you are not in total control of your body. There are people who are controlling what you can wear, um, how you can behave, what jobs, what education you can have in other countries, and also do you control uh, the fetus inside of your body as well. Now, when it comes to resistance art, and some of the best resistance art, I think, is done by Emery Douglas, an American artist who was the Minister of Culture for the Black Panthers Party until the party was disbanded by Ronald Reagan uh, in the 1980s. He forced the kind of uh, the Black Panthers to disband as a type of terrorist organization. So the Black Panthers formed to stop black people from being abused by the government and by the police to fight back. How do you respond to violence? Do you respond like Gandhi with nonviolence? Or is it more effective to respond to violence with violence? By, the 19, by 1970, though, the British Black Panthers shifted their uh, emphasis from survival programs that are opposing violence, and they start getting into community building by giving African Americans free food and clothing, providing breakfast programs, health clinics, free legal aid, and teaching people what the law is and also how to stand up and how to make sure that you are best represented in your legal system. So when you look at the graphic design and the art of Emory Douglas, I think the first thing you noticed in this image here of Fred Hampton, the deputy chairman of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panthers Party, who was murdered by police in Chicago in 1969. And I call it a murder because that's exactly what it was. The police, of course, were giving a different story. So the look of this does not look like advertising. I think good resistance art looks like the opposite of either uh, official art of the state or of commercial advertising. In this case, it has a rawness to it. And of course, um, the statement in here, which I think uh, is something that is always important to remember. You can jail a revolutionary, but you can't jail the revolution. You can run a freedom fighter around the country, 
but you can't run freedom fighting around the country. You can murder a liberator, but you can't murder liberation. I think those are words that are just as true today as when they were written. And this is another example of Emery Douglas's artwork, the beautiful line drawings that he's doing, and of course, the sentiment in the magazine that's being passed out, all power to the people. So various forms of art that Trevor Paglin's art will fit into that we'll be studying. I say definitely Trevor Paglin is a conceptual artist, um, and absolutely his aesthetic is not a commercialized aesthetic in terms of the timelines and diagrams he makes. We see conceptual art in the 1960s um, defined by Saul LeWitt in talking about conceptual art being all about the idea and that how it looks does not matter. In other words, cute, beautiful, slick aesthetics are not as important as the idea and in fact may get in the way of the idea. One of my favorite works of conceptual art is in the bottom, Joseph Kosuth's One in Three Chairs, a wooden folding chair, a photograph of a chair, and an enlargement of a dictionary definition of a chair. All three of these are necessary for a chair to exist. Let's think about Plato and Plato's forms again. So for a chair to exist in the real world, it must exist as a template in your mind first. It doesn't become a chair until it starts there. The chair in your mind, the image of the chair, or in this case, the photo of the chair, may be the most pure form of the chair rather than the real chair itself. And of course, without a name for this object, it wouldn't be a chair, now would it? It would be something else. So you need the word, you need the object, you need the image. All three of them create chair. And I know in a way that's kind of simple in terms of how I describe that kind of duh, of course, but I had never thought about that and crystallized that until I first read about this artwork and then realized what it was saying. Also, I'd like to get into performance art as well, and not necessarily performance art that is strictly engaged in political action. Although I think in terms of performativity, we are always engaged in political action. Whether we know it or not, everything you do has a political implication. The food that you buy, well, what does the money that the food that you buy go to uh, and the people that uh, you buy clothes from, cars from, what are their political activities? How is your money being spent? Everything has some political attribute to it. In terms of performance art, I like this work by Sam Shea in his one-year performances. So he would do these one-year performances where he spent uh, a year in a cage, counting down time. He spent a year outside in New York City. And this is his time clock performance here, where every hour on the hour, he would punch the time clock for 365 days. Think about sleeping in relationship to doing that. He started out with short hair and let his hair grow. And there are a few videos you can see a little bit of that here in the video. So to begin, I've punched a time clock in my studio every hour on the hour for one year. So Sam is playing a worker. So he has the punch cards, he has photographs of what he's done, and we see him looking very, very, very tired with his long hair at the end of his performance. We all perform in our lives. Who you are behind closed doors when you're by yourself is not who you are at your job. 
We are always performing some role. It might be teacher, might be student, might be employee, it might be boss. Always performing. This is part of a kind of broader art subject, performance art, that is not based on making an object, but instead based on the artist live in front of an audience doing some sort of action. Could be Sharon Hayes doing her speech acts in a public uh, a vein, or it could be in an art space with Marina Abramovic and Ule standing face to face in a narrow door and forcing anyone to come into that art space to brush up against two nude bodies. Again, another political act. Being nude in public has political and legal ramifications. Again, getting back to what can you do with your body. Marina also studies the audience in her work Rhythm Zero, where she acts as an object to be moved, to be sat in a chair, and then she leaves implements for the live audience to use on her for the time period that she prescribes. Per performance art always has to have a designated time so you know that it's art and not just everyday shenanigans. And what we find in this very frightening uh, work of art is that if you let an audience do anything, they will do anything, including cutting her face, taking a gun and putting, making her put the gun in her hand with a bullet in it up to her neck. Uh, it is a various dangerous situation when the audience has full control. Another great performance art, and this video here of Chris Burden's early performance pieces, I think is one of the best documents in how a performance artist was operating in the 1970s. He was a conceptual artist and a performance artist. Very famous photograph of him pointing a, uh, what appears to be a 38 at an airplane leaving LAX that ultimately mandated that federal laws be made in terms of pointing a gun at an airplane. In the bottom image, Chris did his bed piece where he laid in bed for 22 days and forced the gallerist to figure out what to do with the body when it has become an object in terms of taking care of uh, going to the bathroom and as well as feeding this object. One of my very favorite artists working in the world today is Christina Wong, graduate of UCLA, one of the great performance artists and writers and theater performers. Um, I am a huge, huge fan of Christina Wong. One of my favorite of her video projects is Radical Cram School. In Radical Cram School, Christina has made... Um, she has made sets and uniforms, and she is teaching students how to become radicalized, how to become an activist in the vein of black power movements and the yellow peril, and also done with an incredible sense of humor that Christina Wong has. Uh, Christina was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize recently, and uh, I think that she is a very, very big, important artist. Now, I think that she's going uh, to get much bigger. I think she's going to have some major kind of elvish years coming up. Here's a couple of seconds of Radical Cram School. Welcome to Radical Cram School. We're going to learn about social justice, revolution, and how to be powerful in the bodies that you have. Hi. 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 Who was Grace Lee Boggs? Do you remember? Yes. Tell me about what you remember about her. Um, I remember that Grace Lee Boggs was a writer, philosophist, activist, and feminist. She was born in Rhode Island, 1915, and her parents were Chinese immigrants. So if you've been following my lectures, you, I think you can see very easily why I love this, um, because this, uh, to me, is some of the smartest art, 
but also very relatable in terms of art not just being in galleries and museums, but also being something that kind of anyone can see as entertainment. Uh, if you're not aware of Christina Wong, uh, I would say look into her, and you might be as entertained as I am, I hope. Another one of my very, very, very favorite artists right now is Hennessy Youngman. And his videos absolutely show the stupidity and the hypocrisy in the art world, especially, I think, around how MFA programs are designing artists to think about art. As an artist, and something that we studied early in our class, we learned about Dada and appropriation art, and we learned that an artist... Um, took a urinal, put it on its side, and called it art because it was on a pedestal in a gallery, and Marcel Ducamp, of course, was a famous, well-known artist at the time. And that kind of changes the entire nature of what art can be. Hennessy, a clearly uh, well-trained in the tactics of art, and also using stereotypes in pop culture and hip-hop culture, is our narrator. The link to the video, Art Thoughts, How to Make an Art, is I, something I show my students all the time. I think it's quite brilliant. He taps into that art can be anything, and then does a video really mocking that. And then he ends kind of with the urinal that I had talked about. And I'll, I'll show you how this thing ends here. So we'll watch kind of the last, uh, oh, 45 seconds of this. Yo, don't you just hate when junkies be trying to sell their mother's shit? Art. Your unemployed brother in his 40s who still lives with your mom and doesn't do shit. He ain't serving no purpose, so art. And it's performance art, too. So that's like double, double art points right there. Well, this isn't art because I can actually piss in this, and so it's still serving a function, so not art. So yeah, Internet, that's it. Don't fret. If you can't make these types of arts, then there's always video art, and that's it. Peace. One love. That's fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I highly recommend getting into, uh, anytime you can uh, get into Hennessy Youngman, I think if you watch a half hour of his videos, that is the equivalent of getting a master's in fine art. And I, and I say that jokingly, but I really do believe it. Tactical media is art used um, for overt political purposes. Tactical media, the name of tactical media is coined in 1996, that is using things like the internet to trick and deceive governments and government operatives like the uh, website gwbush.com, uh, which is not run by G.W. Bush, but a, uh, a person who is quite concerned and definitely is not, did not vote uh, in two elections for Bush. This fits into the idea of culture jamming. And by the way, culture jamming is exactly what we were seeing the CIA doing with that comic book in Nicaragua. So getting into a culture and jamming its smooth working function is something that artists do, especially artists like the Yes Men, who have, have had a website that shadowed the World Trade Organization and when people were less savvy with the internet, organizations that want a representative from the World Trade Organization might end up with one of these artists from Cal Arts, and then they will act in a way that is in the exact opposite of a company uh, or uh, the, the World Trade Organization. Uh, their documentary, The Yes Men, uh, probably is one of the best films made about culture jamming. The Gorilla Girls were culture jammers, are culture jammers themselves. Uh, they're a group of female uh, artists, mostly I think professors also, who act anonymously, wear gorilla masks in public, and they ask the Met Museum by renting a billboard across from the Met why are less than 5% of the artists in the modern section women, but 85% of the nudes are female? 
do women have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? And because of groups like the Guerrilla Girls, the percentage of women artists and women representation is probably up around 30, 35% today. Um, yes, it's still not equal, but groups like this have helped it to become closer to being equal. Um, I have a, a couple slides that I'm probably not going to talk about here. Critical Art Ensemble and their progeny, um, Finishing School, I think also are very important groups on tactical media. I think the Patriot Library by Ed Jardina and his group Finishing School is really important in terms of opposing the Patriot Act, which was an act passed by Congress that allowed for more surveillance on American citizens, also made public libraries a place where librarians had to put people who checked citizens, American citizens, who checked out materials deemed dangerous by the government and to be put on a list. In the Patriot Library, by finishing school, they are in a gallery, but they make a library that allow you to see a number of those books, check them out, and decide for yourself if they're dangerous, and also not be in fear of being on a list. Landscapes and art, and then we'll get to Trevor Paglin. So there is a long history of landscape art, beginning really around the Renaissance for the most part. And perhaps maybe perfected in Dutch landscapes. In Dutch landscapes, we get these landscape paintings with long flat horizon lines, big, big sky taking up most of the canvas. And what you almost always find in these Dutch landscapes in the 17th century is some sort of Protestant reformative church with a steeple that is grounded in the earth but piercing the sky. So the two halves, you could say, of sky and ground are tied together by the church and the steeple. In landscape art, we find, I think, in romantic landscapes, what we find from Immanuel Kant and Kant's judgment is we find the sublime. And in the sublime, we see nature as so overwhelmingly powerful that it causes the subject and our ego inside of us to feel infinitely small. And that sense of awe and wonder in the landscape is something that I think we find in J.M.W. Turner's landscapes. This painting here of the fire that broke out in the House of Parliament in 1834. And although we are clearly far away from this massive fire, we can see how large and how frightening and the smoke filling up the air. Often in romantic landscapes, uh, we get a sense of wonderment and the sublime and sometimes kind of wonderful warm feelings like we get in Constable in this particular painting, which I think is very different than this very abstract Constable here, where in the seascape study with the rain cloud, again, getting that sense of danger on the horizon and, again, that looming sense of the sublime within the work. Um, obviously, landscapes in photographs, uh, there's a long history of that. Generally, in pure or straight photography like Ansel Adams, what we look for is a full range or a great patterning of value systems. There's a lot more there, but... Let's get into the hidden world of Trevor Paglin and then into your assignment. So part of what we're looking when we watch the video Six Landscapes by Trevor, he is showing us art that he made that is scrutinizing the scrutinizers. 
and in particular looking at the NSA, the National Security Administration. So the NSA is responsible for global monitoring, collection, and processing of information and data of foreign and domestic intelligence and counterintelligence purposes. Unlike the CIA, the NSA is also conducting surveillance within the borders of the United States itself. And they have been in controversies in a number of different ways. We really get a window in 2013 into the NSA, and maybe we don't know a lot about them, until Edward Snowden, a former contractor for the NSA, releases a number of documents in Wikilinks, and we begin to see that the NSA is tracking hundreds of millions of people through their cell phone metadata. Trevor Paglin. American artist, geographer, and author who tackles mass surveillance and data collection. He is looking into the murky worlds of global state surveillance. And a lot of his work, including limit telephotography, we are seeing landscapes of things that cannot be seen with the unaided eye, mostly employing telescopes and long-range photography at the limit of what they can do to find secret buildings and secret places where the government doesn't want you to know that they're operating. There's a short Art 21 on Trevor, but I think the masterpiece is Trevor Paglin's Six Landscapes Lecture. That, I think that is mandatory viewing to anyone in the arts or anyone concerned about how the American government is operating. So Trevor has a BA in Religious Studies from Berkeley. He has a MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a PhD in Geography from Berkeley as well. So he understands about ideology, he understands photography, and he also understands landscapes. So here we're seeing the photograph, They Watch the Moon in 2010. And again, he is making these photographs standing as close as he can get to government land that is fenced off and uh, is illegal to tread upon. And he is trying to see, what do these buildings look like? And then through um, real thorough investigation, and a number of friends and allies, he is finding out as much information that is possible through um, uh, researching uh, um, these very murky um, um, uh, establishments. So the undersea cables photograph. This is a undersea cable that is uh, for uh, transferring the internet across the Atlantic Ocean to Europe. And what Pagan found as he was looking for the cable and then following the cable out into international waters, that once the cable is in international waters, there is a splice on this cable that is going back into the United States, showing us that no messages are not being scrutinized that are coming from Europe or going to Europe. In the fence, we see through um, uh, a form of electromagnetic photography, we are seeing the frequencies that our eyes could not see of what is known as the fence, a powerful radar system surrounding the entire United States an electric magnetic border that extends far into space from transmitters in Alaska, California, Texas, Massachusetts, Greenland, and the United Kingdom. It's designed to track spacecraft overflying the United States and to serve as an early warning system to detect ballistic missile launches. In the other night sky, we see years worth of research in, in the Desert Valley under the Sierra Nevada mountains where he is using telescopic equipment to track and photograph nearly 200 classified American spacecrafts 
orbiting the sky at any given time. The invisible other sky harbors deep secrets, as do many of the government-controlled sites that Pagan documents as part of his larger practice. He also brings to our attention the torture tra uh, taxi, which I think is one of the best parts of his six landscape lecture. So here, he is finding the, the plane that is not listed as being owned by the CIA, that is listed, um, that is supposed to be a plane of a private citizen, but this citizen does not appear to really ever exist. And what this plane does is it goes to other countries and it kidnaps people that the government has deemed as illegal combatants or terrorists and is illegally taking them out of their countries and taking them to places either in the United States for trial or outside of the United States and outside of the jurisdiction of United States law to torture these individuals. He's tracking flight data and he is also tracking the flights themselves through various ways, various people who are helping him out. He has a book titled, I Could Tell You, But Then You Would Have to Be Destroyed by Me, Emblems from the Pentagon's Black World. He also talks about this in his Six Landscapes lecture. This book is something you can find online. And in this book, you find various emblems, and then you get some sort of idea of what these... So apparently, a lot of these secret organizations... Uh, they have like a casual Friday where they might wear their flight jackets or something along those lines that wearing, displaying patches of the secret organizations that they are in. And Trevor has figured out what these symbols mean um, and then maybe what some of the things that they're saying, like Raptor 4004 just passing through. So what is this patch? This is a commemorative patch for a classified flight test of an F-22 Raptor aircraft at Groom Lake, sharing many symbols with the Special Projects Flight Test Squadron patch. The mascot is a raptor wearing the clothes of a wizard, like those in the Special Projects Flight Test Squadron patch. The Greek letter Sigma hangs from the figure's neck. The collection of six stars is a reference to Area 51. The phrase IDB may reference a intended or actual radar cross through section measurements of the aircraft, and the words just passing through reference the fact that for this test, the airplane had only to fly through the RCS measurement range while engineers collected data for monitoring stations on the ground. So this is an entire book of these patches and Trevor, and in fact, this book I think was so successful that the organizations that he is documenting began passing out memos that perhaps you shouldn't have these patches because there are people now who have identified them. The last slide I want to show you is a video project um, called Project X. Um, it is a video of a building in New York City um, that um, has 29 floors, three basement levels, uh, no windows, enough food for 1,500 people, and couldn't withstand a nuclear blast, and also can keep computer operations going. Its primary purpose is protecting humans from toxic radiation amid a nuclear war, but mostly what it seems that it's doing is it's monitoring telecommunications in the United States and is operated through the New York Telephone Company, a subsidiary of AT&T. The video is outstanding in its production. Um, it has an artistic quality, I think, in the quality of the video. And then we are getting a narration through documents describing what this building is and how to behave in this building. And I say also the same thing in terms of art in his photographs. 
When you watch the Art 21 on Trevor Paglin, it spends a lot of time talking about how Trevor is very concerned in his artwork about aesthetics. Here's a couple of seconds of Field of Vision. Temporary Duty Handbook, a guide for traveling to site. The purpose of this handbook is to provide proper procedures and guidelines when traveling on official business in support of the program. Traveler is not to overtly identify him or herself as an employee of the National Security Agency or a member of the intelligence community. The program has and then we're going to drive to the site and again we are going to be informed about how to behave what your restrictions are you shouldn't wear your uniforms to the site everything should be as invisible as possible and that really is the essence of Trevor's artwork showing us the invisible making the invisible visible, and again, having us ask questions about how the government operates and what are our responsibilities in letting the government operate beyond our abilities as citizens to monitor them and beyond our, our abilities um, to accept that certain programs and people and organizations in the government uh, are active beyond the law. Now, let's be clear. These organizations will tell you that the reason they operate the way they operate is for your protection. And I think what's important is for you to look at both sides and decide for yourself um, what the truth is and how you want to operate as an American citizen in relationship to this stuff. So, find uh, the link to the Six Landscapes lecture. I want you to describe the way that Trevor uses art to uncover, to make things visible that are otherwise invisible. I want you to give me examples of them. And then also, share your thoughts on the video project field of Vision Project X. And then I also want to get your opinions on the artwork. Now that you know that art deals not just in aesthetics for aesthetics sake, but also deals in aesthetics in terms of the relationship of aesthetics and government or resisting government, and then also art that is made primarily as a source to inform you about your government, what do you think about this as art? How do you feel about it? I look forward to seeing what you have uh, to say about this. I hope you enjoyed the materials. Talk to you soon.